I'm a big believer that everyone in America has the potential to add $100 a month to their income if they actually tried. How many people do you think actually know about this? Not enough. Are we screwed as a country? For the first time in three and a half years, people are gonna have to pay their student loans, so we've somehow rewired Americans' brains to not think. And they don't wanna hear it if you like throw out something that might contrast with like a belief system. Like always, the government plays with the numbers. What they actually did was... <laughs> Welcome friends, Bobby Hoy here, MillennialMoneyMan.com. Welcome to the second episode, The Money Shop. We had a great episode this time. I had uh, Robert Farrington on from TheCollegeInvestor.com. He's been a good friend of mine for years now. We talked about all of the stuff that's happening like today, where it seems like maybe the world's falling apart a little bit, but maybe it's not. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Robert Farrington, what's up, buddy? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Great. Oh, I'm always, every time I see you, I'm always so jealous because I know what's behind it. Like, I know what's behind that background, I think. <laughs> you let's, I mean, I don't know if you want to show the people, but you're in your garage, right? I am in my garage for like another month and a half. And then, uh, I will have a new office and studio that hopefully should look like yours. Like really nice behind me, not just, uh, you know, a drop curtain. Yeah. But I mean, I think the thing, the difference between mine and yours, like what's the, what's the temperature right there? In San, San Diego, San Diego, seventy-eight. So, <sighs> this is a window right here, so I have to have right. another light to like offset the brightness, you know. And your garage doors open? No, no. Otherwise, you'd hear like cars and stuff. <laughs> Can't do that. We gotta have great quality for the podcast here. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true. How how is San Diego treating you? Doing you it's still great. still feeling it? Still liking it? You know, pros and cons, right? It's it's there's a lot of good things, and then there's a lot of annoying things. Yeah. You know what, dude, um, we just did a, we did a team retreat in Bend, Oregon. You ever been there? You know, I drove through there this summer on a road trip. Um, oh, cool town. We got smoked out though. There was like a wildfire, but, uh, it was, it was a cool town. Real smoky for sure. We, we got there on it. So we went last week. It was like Monday through Friday. We got there Monday. It was like 90 degrees, something like that. And then like the smoke though, like flying in was, I don't know if I've ever seen that before. And I, I guess that's. I guess a little bit more, maybe not where you are in San Diego, but like on the West coast, like probably we get pretty... wildfires. Yeah. It's one of the things you get, <sighs> man. It was, that part was crazy. But then like the, uh, even at 90 degrees, like 90 there versus 90 in Texas is like a totally different animal. Um, and then the next day that the, the uh, smoke cleared out and it was like, it was paradise. It was probably like Northern California if I had to guess. Um, yeah, it's very similar vibes. Yeah. But the, what was interesting though, like we took a lot of Ubers and the Uber, I didn't realize there was this dynamic uh, with California. Cause I've talked to you about like moving to California and stuff. They don't like people from California very much in Oregon. No. <laughs> that's well, like especially on the uh, Eastern side of Oregon, you know, you get more love from California if you're in Portland and uh, some of the Western side, but Eastern Oregon is, it's kind of like Idaho, Wyoming, you know, they yeah. don't, they don't want Californians. Yeah. I didn't realize that there was this thing. Uh, I mean, obviously the main thing was like house prices, right? Like everybody was like, they're coming out, like they're moving out of California and they're driving our home prices up. But I didn't realize there was this phenomenon of like, they're, they're moving out of California, selling their homes and buying two homes in the place that they live. Like I they're buying, <laughs> they're buying, um, they're buying a home and then a vacate and then like an Airbnb basically. Wow. So then they're like, they're taking up, you know, inventory and yeah. also drive the prices up. And it, that's happening. Like, you know, Washington and just all the surrounding states. But then like in Idaho, somebody was telling us about like Idaho is like really, yeah. um, so how does it feel to be like hated just for the state? Well, that you're I, from? I think I told you, you know, one of our big things is we love going on family road trips. Right. And so yeah. every summer we take two weeks to a month and we go get out of California. And, uh, what, two years ago we were in Montana at the rodeo and in the dirt on the Damn. back of our car, Someone wrote, go home. Oh, and they no, put a dude. happy face. They put a happy face, though. It wasn't like they were trying, you know, they definitely didn't want us there, but. Uh, they were nicely telling you to get out. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a catch 22 because you talk to a lot of people, too. And it's like, they always are like, oh, you know, California, this and that. And it's like, yeah, we're trying to get out of that. Like, we support what you support. That's why we came here, but then they don't want you here. <laughs> Like, what do you want me to do? You want me to stay in California because I disagree with things or I hate it. So right. I'm coming here. And then they're like, you don't want me here either. Yeah. Um, it's a very catch-22. And I know a lot of these economies, um, especially in the summertime, are, are driven by people coming. I think it's just so many people are coming, right? A lot of these yeah. places are touristy. They rely on them for their economy. 
but you know, yeah. there's, there's a limit, right? And when you get way too many people, it gets hard. Yeah. It's, I, I find myself very often because I, I do love California a lot. Like I find myself like telling myself all the bad things about it. I'm like, no, I can't live there. Cause X, Y, Z thing. My mother-in-law actually just went out there and, uh, she was talking about like the grocery prices are so wildly different than something like Texas, like 30 to 40% higher. It seems like, and just like everything. Like, have you, is that pretty much the experience so far? It's just been, things have gone crazy. You know, things are crazy. They, they are more expensive. I wouldn't say groceries are one of them. I mean, I think the one thing with California is you have a plethora of like the Whole Foods and private markets and stuff mm -hmm. that definitely have it high. But like, I mean, you can buy Amazon grocery and still get like $1.99 milk and eggs and things. So it's like, you know, you pick and choose. Um, there's yeah. ways to, to save. I think gas prices are for some reason, always a dollar higher. Like, I don't understand right. it. It's just, <laughs> just by default, by default, like well, that's a baseline. And then, you know, you tack on everything else, which that's kind of silly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it's very car centric here, right? Like, I mean, there's mass transit sucks. So you can't really do anything else. Yeah. And how, and housing prices, I think are the big one. I, I think if you could eliminate the, like housing as like a outlier, most things would be very equivalent. Um, yeah. in terms of your daily costs. Um, and, but people have to realize too, that like, I think one of the biggest things that's taken out of the debate is on average, you will earn a lot more money in California than oh, you will sure. anywhere else. Like the median income is higher. The minimum wage now, I think in San Diego is like 18, 50 an hour. And I think in like two years, it's up to like $22 an hour. And like, like you can go to target right now and be a cashier and make 20 bucks an hour. Chick-fil-A is 20 yeah. bucks an hour. So it's like you just naturally earn more. And I think that's kind of missed in the debate um, a lot. I think so. so do you know, I had Larry on yesterday. Um, we were talking about uh, teacher salaries. Do you have any idea what the California teacher average salary is? I don't. Dude, the, I, the ca well, I'll, it's a, it's a I, really crazy one. The California median teacher salaries in the 60s, I think, I knew you which were is high for answer. a teacher. Uh, but the starting ones aren't great. And I think the hard part is, is they have a really hard time retaining teachers because they burn them out in like two or three years. But then you have this big giant chunk of tenured teachers that have been there for 15, 20 years that are making 80 K plus yeah. they have all their benefits. Plus they have, you know, a bunch of perks, right? Like summers off and things like that. Right. So. Yeah. I think the average in New York was like 80 or maybe, I don't know if it was 83, zero seventy-eight 78 or 83, something like that. Um, but it's just so wild because like Texas, it, it was when I started teaching, it was 53 or no, the the average is 49, something like that. And then I was making a little bit more, but it's just so wild. It's like, I, you told me one time, this is, I don't know if you remember this, this is years ago. Um, you used to work at Target and mm -hmm. you were a manager at Target and you told me your Target salary. And I was like, what? <laughs> like it was such a wild number compared to what I thought it was going to be. Okay. Um, well, so I, I, well, when I found it, so the average uh, teacher salary for California for last year this is the average, um, $85,856 is the average teacher salary, Dang. um, in California. And it doesn't start there, but the one thing that California does, I don't know if you have this in Texas is that, um, we have like the transparency pay law. So if you work any type of civil service job from a teacher to a public service, um, you can go on this website and you can pull everyone's individual salary, <laughs> see what they make. I don't know if we have that. <laughs> that doesn't sound, I don't know if, I don't know if we would want that here. I don't, Texas is pretty like pretty anti that kind of stuff, but maybe, maybe we do. I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, kind of to route out government corruption, but now it's like, you just see some of these people's salaries and you're just like, Oh, okay. You know, but we don't change any of the laws. <laughs> yeah. Like, do you think it, it, it has helped do that with corruption? Do you think it has actually stopped? You know, there's definitely bit? some interesting things that you can see people do because like a lot of California still has a pension and like, it's like based on your last five years of your salary. And so in a lot of these city and state governments, like they'll promote people to things that like don't really exist or like aren't needed just to give them like a bump before they retire. Oh. Um, and there's a lot of things like that, but it's kind of like what they do these days. Right. Yeah, I, I guess. Well, I guess so. I don't know. Yeah. It's like, it's very interesting because like, I think, uh, like in Texas, I don't, they don't really do that. I think you do see people move up in the administration right before they retire to, to bump it up. Cause it's, I think the way they do it, it's been a while since I was a teacher, but it was like the, the top five years of your salary averaged out. And then you get like a percentage of that as your, um, I guess your pension. Um, I remember when I, dude, I cashed out mine out of the TRS system. And I think that they were like, when I cashed it out, 
and this was, it was like twelve thousand dollars. But like they they said you can keep it in. Maybe it was twenty. Um, you can keep it in, and we'll give you a guaranteed two percent return for the rest of your life. It was like, and a lot of people yeah. take that. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people are just like, oh, I'll take that guaranteed. Um, I just put it in a brokerage account, but or I or, um, transferred it into an IRA. But it's just wild. It's like. I think you're right. Like a lot of people don't think about that though. It's the California conversation. It's just the, the salaries are high there. And it's, you were like, it's kind of balling it's, at target, right? Like you were. Yeah. Of- I mean, I think that's a lot of places though too. Like I think people dismiss that, but you have to realize, I mean, I think I was, you know, when I started as a, you know, assistant manager out of college, I was at like 42, but I think by the time I left target, you were starting assistant managers at like 55 and I'm sure it's probably like 65, 70 today. I don't even know. Right. But like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, you know, that's an assistant manager and you figure that every target store has like six of those guys, okay. seven, and then there's the store manager. So when I got promoted to store manager, I mean, your base pay is about a hundred. Um, mm-hmm. and then you can go up from there. But what a lot of people don't realize in retail is the money's in the bonus. So your bonus structure can go up to like 60 or 70% of your base salary. And then you get like stock options. And then I was grandfathered in under a pension too, because I'd been there for so long. And so, yeah, I mean, (laughs) I was making 180, you know, or so a year as a target store manager. And this was seven, eight years ago at this point in time. And I definitely knew wow. some of my peers that had been in Target because their base pay was up to like 180 and they were having great years. And so they were making almost 300K. Um, <laughs> that's just such a, I would have never guessed that. Like, I, that's just, um, I mean, that's awesome. That, that's a great, I mean, that's a great sound. What, did, did you feel like it was like, a, I mean, did you hate it? Were you like working yourself into the ground or was it pretty I, I wasn't, but I know a lot of people did. But it played to a lot of my strengths, so managing people, executing, getting things done. I would say by the, my last couple of years at Target, I was only working 36 to 40 hours a week, and I managed really great teams and had everything dialed in with great stores, and everyone was winning, and it was really – it was fun. Um, but I know a lot of people do get burnout, and they yeah. don't know how to handle it. Um, it's hard. You have to deal with people. And it, it, what I don't think people realize is that being a, a retail store manager at that level, not like a small box, but a big box store, it's all about managing your team. So my store had 120 regular time employees, and that would balloon up to like 180 or so on the holidays. And some of my peer stores, like we have a store in our area that's top 10 in the company in terms of sales, did $100 million in sales a year. Uh, I mean, their their average team was 240, and then like they would balloon up into almost 400 employees, and so like that's the scale you're managing. And so like my store was only a 50 million dollar store, which I mean, that's 50 million dollars in gross sales. Like uh, you know, me making 150k a year doesn't really seem right. outlandish. Yeah. Running a leading 110 people and yada yada, and wow. dealing with the public, you know. So I don't think people realize that's the scale that these stores are. Um, you know, like Target doesn't open a store that doesn't make, you know, 30 to 40 million dollars. So if there's one in your area, even in like a smaller town, it's probably making 30, 30 million a year. So wow. right? are you pretty uh, are you pretty bullish on Target? No, very bearish right now. Really? Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've seen my tweet storm lately. I've been talking about it. I've been I love your tweet stories. I haven't seen yeah. them lately. I've been off Twitter a little bit, but like I love it when you start. X. Tweeting. X. Yeah. Oh, God dang it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, X. I, but I love it when you, yeah, because you you do some you do some good stuff, and you you like, yeah, you you very real on X. Well, I'm not even that too. It's uh, you know, Target's down like their stock's down, um, you know, fifty percent so far, and I'm Jeez. very bearish. I think they're gonna have a, I think they're gonna have like three to four years of struggle to figure themselves out. Um, and why I say that is, I was into a Target lately, and um, at least in our area, they've locked everything up. Like you can't buy, you can't buy shampoo and conditioner. It's like behind plexiglass. So, but here's the problem. And I know this from experience is, you know, what people do is they just don't buy it. They (laughs) change their behaviors and they start looking online, buying it from other retailers and stuff. And so they invest, I'm just doing the math. I'm like, you invested millions and millions into this. You're going to lose a ton of sales on this. And then you're going to figure it out in a year. And then you're going to spend millions and millions to take it all out. (laughs) <laughs> and throw it all away <laughs> and you're going to have all these costs. And I think it's going to really impact them for the next couple of years as they try to figure it out. Because I think, and you can see these teams, I've been into a few stores, they're very demoralized. Like the leadership's failing them. They're really frustrated, especially in California, but you see it on the news, like people shoplifting yeah. and stuff. 
they're just missing a lot of these basic skills of interacting with their shoppers and, you know, taking care of them. People are frustrated with self checkouts. I know it saves them in labor, but like you're losing customers to this because yeah. I'm going to target for an experience. Why would I do this? Or I'm just gonna order on Amazon or online. Like you're not delivering a level of service that people are expecting in there to yeah. fight your competitors. I don't know. Yeah. Would you ever, I mean, it's really interesting. You see like the, uh, so I, I, what did I see the other day? People were like dancing inside of a target. Do you see that one where it was like the manager was like trying to get them to stop dancing in the target? And like, I don't know. It was, it just seemed like, uh, it seems like a lot of people kind of protest inside of targets or, or whatever, like whatever they're mad about that seems to manifest in targets. Like, would you ever go back? Do you think like if just for whatever reason, business blows up or something, not that it would, but would you ever yeah, go back I mean, that way? It's a it's a great company to work for. I don't know if it still is, but it, it seems like it would be, um, you know, but I, I can see myself taking that skill set to either target. I even go to like Walmart, you know, Walmart's crushing it. I don't know about you, but like, we love the Walmart and Sam's club. Um, yeah. Sam's club's awesome. Yeah. We're, we're, we're fans. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying like, it seems like when I worked at target, like Walmart was like five years behind target in terms of like how they were designing their stores and their customer yeah. service and their technology. And then it seems like target like plateaued and Walmart just kept going. And now in our area, like their stores are solid. Their staffing is <laughs> solid. Their technology. Like, I don't know if you go to Sam's club and you pay out, you scan everything on your phone and you just show it on the way out. Yeah. And like, you don't even have to check out. It's like glorious. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, I think my wife, coral is is single-handedly keeping target alive i we get the boxes to the door like i, I swear all the time so they've still got something they've got they've got some people but buying. you're not going to the stores and so like no. I, I would say like for like a target or any of these big retailers is the money is in you buying their clothes and their makeup and those kind of things yeah if you're just you're having your baby formula and wipes and stuff delivered there's no money in that and probably after shipping like you're barely breaking even and so like Target wants you to go in and that's why they like hit you with like, oh, the cool trendy clothes and stuff. Cause like, they know you need your essentials, but they want you to like throw in a shirt into the cart and they want you to, that's and when you're ordering online, yeah, they're selling stuff, but it's not like super profitable. Do you think it's, I mean, do you think it's almost like a loss leader? Like, is it just, is it that close well, to food's a loss leader for them? It lists the fresh stuff. Really? Um, and so the whole premise of even all these targets adding in food, and this was a decade ago, was that if you're buying fresh food, like berries and stuff, you got to come like every week, right? So That's I could true. sell it to you for zero, make no money, right? Like effectively <laughs> just break even, but you're in my building every week and that's a win, right? Wow. I've never even thought about that before. Like, honestly, I've never even really thought about it. I've always just assumed that like, I've always assumed that retail's just like really, really rough margins but I wouldn't have thought like groceries, but that totally makes sense. I'm now I'm going to like, look, I'm going to go to grocery stores and not ever see them the same way again. Yeah, Did, is it the same way like, for grocery stores? Yeah. I mean, they're much more optimized in terms of their produce. So they might eke out like 5% on their fresh stuff, but yeah. where they make their money is, um, all the, the dry stuff that has longer shelf life. Usually you get like 20% margins on that stuff. And then if you get over into like, I mean, if you ever go to a grocery store and you see like their paper towels, the toilet papers, they're significantly more expensive than like a, target or a Walmart. Yeah. So that paper goods, they're probably making a bunch and then their alcohol, um, mm. you know, alcohol has got good margins, usually like 50% plus. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could see so, that. Yeah. Yeah. I could see that, man. This is why I wanted to have you on. You're like a, you're like a walking <laughs> encyclopedia of knowledge, uh, for things that I never know about. Um, so you said you've been busy lately. You've been, you October's coming up. What do you, what do you, what do you got going on? I mean, we got all kinds of stuff. I mean, for the first time in what, three and a half years, people are gonna have to pay their student loans. So I've just been on a tear of the last while. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's what we talk a lot about. So are we, screwed? we've been talking a lot about it. <laughs> are we, are we screwed? Like as a, as a country, are we screwed? No, not in the least. Okay. Um, I okay. think it's very overhyped, um, in terms of like the in financial impacts of student loan debt. Um, yeah, it's, what's it walk me through it. What's going to happen? What, what, what are we, what are we seeing here in the next, obviously restarts in October. So what's, what's happening? Uh, payments are due. Um, so you got 45 million people that are going to have to start making their student loan payments. But what I think is a lot of people don't realize in this debate is before the pandemic, seven to 10% of people didn't pay their student loans. They were in default. Yeah. That's probably going to continue. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I can actually see that going up to like 15%, maybe 20% in the short term. But I think, you know, within a year, that'll probably get back to its historical average, which 
it's not great, but that's what it is. And then I think a lot of people miss the fact that 30 to 40% of all student loan borrowers are on these income driven repayment plans. Yeah. And so they pay a percentage of their income and they paid a percentage of their income before the pandemic and they'll pay a percentage of their income now, except the Biden administration recently lowered that percentage to 5%. And, uh, you know, a lot of people qualify for $0 a month payments. <laughs> yeah. So I saw that. It's like, okay, payments are restarting, <laughs> but like those that are like hurting the most financially, it's, they pay zero. And it, it sounds very like uncaring of me, but it's like <laughs> your monthly, your monthly budget, like what you bring in every month is not going to radically change because of these student loans. And those that do feel an impact, the only reason you're feeling an impact is because you make a significant amount of money. And when I say that is like this new save plan, if, if you're a family of four, you have to make over $65,000 a year before your payment goes past zero. Yeah. So like you're at zero dollars at sixty five thousand dollars a year, um, like you have to make. And then even if I was, I did the math. Like if you're at eighty five thousand, you're at like fifty. And if you're like a hundred thousand as a family of four, you're maybe at a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it still might be tight, but like you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year to have right. that payment. It's not. You, you should know, be. I, I, you know okay. this, Bobby. I'm a big believer that everyone in America has the potential to add a hundred dollars a month to their income if they actually oh, tried. Hundred sure. percent. Yeah. Like between all the different ways you can earn money in this world, you can make a hundred bucks a month if you wanted to. If you wanted to. If That's you the thing. To. A lot of people don't <laughs> a lot of people don't really seem to want to. Um and I think it's hard to get started. But uh going back to the save plan, like can you can you detail a little bit more about like what's in that? I have not been following that. Yeah. So the new save plan, it's a rebrand of uh, repay. So a lot of people are like, how's the administration doing this? Well, they just took an existing plan and changed a few of the rules um, and they're allowed to do that. So what it does is it sets your monthly student loan payment as 5% of your discretionary income, but your discretionary income is now calculated as 225% of the poverty line, Okay, which Basically, in your state, you got your poverty line, and they multiply that by 225%. And then whatever that number is, they take 5% of the difference between the poverty line and your income. And that, that is what becomes like your monthly student loan repayment math. So there's some math there, right? Yeah. But like you can basically take the poverty line in your state, multiply it. And that's how you know, like if you're under 65K for a family of four, you're at zero because you're, you know, below 225% of the poverty line. If you're single and you're at like 38,000, um, I think that's the number. Um, you're okay. at zero dollar a month monthly payment um, for your student loans. There's some other cool benefits with this though, too, is historically, if you had a really low or $0 payment, your interest would still make your loan grow, right? Yeah. Like it would negative, it's called negative amortization, right? And this always like hurt people's feelings that like I was making these low payments, but my loan would continue to grow. And now the safe plan actually waives that. So as long as you stay in repayment, your loan balance will never grow. It might not go down. Like right. if you're at a $0 a month payment, it might not go down, but it will never grow. Right. But then the, there's the exit strategy. And the exit strategy is after 20 or 25 years, your balance is forgiven. And that's yeah. always existed. That's existed on income-based repayment. It's existed on pay as you earn. Um, that's not new. I think a lot of people are like, well, you're giving people free. That's, that's been around since 2007. Yeah. Um, that's the law. So your loan balance. But that's the cool thing. Like, let's just say life doesn't work out for you. Like, you graduate. You're just not getting any income. Like, you're stuck in this rut. After 20 years, like you graduated at 22, at 43, your loan balance could be forgiven, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. How many people do you think actually know about this? Not enough. Well, I'll <laughs> tell you, the Department of Education just released that 4 million people would sign up. Um, but, you know, like always, the government plays with the numbers. Um, sure. What they actually did was they said that there was 3 million people in repay. <laughs> Since we converted Dude. them to, to save, we're <laughs> counting them as signing up for it. Um, so oh really, God. there's about a million new people that weren't on the existing repay plan that signed up for save. Granted, it's only been around since July, and there's not been a lot of communication around it. Um, right. there hasn't even been a lot of communication around loan payments restarting, um, except from like private media companies, like, yeah. you know, they're not like, you're not seeing like Biden out there giving speeches. You're not like hearing anyone talk about this. Like, I feel like we're really doing a lot of borrowers a disservice. 
um, in Why general. Why do you think that is? Do you think there's a reason that they're not really doing that? I, I think they're pretty inept um, in terms mm. of building a communication strategy. I think we saw that with every single payment pause extension. Like they waited until like 26 days before loans would restart, and they're like, ah, "Actually, we're gonna we're gonna extend it again." Like they're just really inept. That's crazy. Do you think that they could get better at it? <laughs> like, is it is it too far gone? Because it's so interesting. Because I see the, I mean, you and I've seen, you know, there's plenty of players in the the kind of student loan space. But I think you are one of the best at just like putting out really detailed information, and you're just like a wealth of knowledge on this stuff. But like, it seems like the need for that is so high because people generally have no idea what's actually going on. I will say, um, let's give the Department of Education a little credit that they actually probably have the best government website of any agency in really? the government. Studentaid.gov. If you guys want to, you can this. actually like pull your student loan information. You can log in. You can apply for these repayment plans and all that kind of stuff. Where I think the Department of Education really sucks is literally a communication strategy. Like They don't know how to market in today's media environment. They don't know how to build connections with people. And then I would say part two is, and this is where they've struggled for 20 years, is, um, you know, everyone gets mad at like the Navians and the Nelnets and, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, they they're like, ah, you know, they are contractors for the Department of Education. Like your loans are owned by the government and the Department of Education, and these companies just service them. They need to manage their contractors. Like right. you and I have contractors. And yeah. We manage them. And if they don't do their jobs, we fire them and we do that. And they've done a little bit of that. But <clears throat> that's one area that I think that they definitely need to improve is contract management, auditing, following up, managing their contractors. And then, you know, like hire someone that can actually like communicate your messages and like build a comprehensive media strategy. Like to me, it doesn't seem very hard, especially if your job is like communications and press, like you have a press department, a communications department, like building a, a media strategy to like hit all these talking points and get out there shouldn't be very hard. You should be getting on these podcasts. You should be getting on because let's face it. I think, I think they're really stuck in like 1980s, like strategy where like they yeah. put out a press release, they hope some papers pick it up and they leave mm -hmm. it at that where it's like, dude, that's not how it works. Like, you need to get on and communicate with millennials, Gen X, Gen Z, like these younger adults that are on social media. No one watches the nightly news anymore. Like Lester Holt is only for boomers. Like, right. <laughs> like they're not your audience and you're not reaching your audience. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, have they ever like reached out to you? Have you ever been contacted by Department of Education or any, anything like that to I've had help? a few, um, but no, uh, no. Is that like even legal? Can they even do that? I guess they yeah, could, right? Yeah, they actually should. Like, they're, I, I, I sign up to their press releases, so I see that. But, like, yeah. your job is to do that. Like, if you're in the press department of the Department of Education, that, that's literally your job. Your job should, just like you have a job of, like, marketing your courses and different things, like, you probably have yeah. an influencer list, and you probably, if I was, like, a company, like, I'd have an influencer list. Like, here's, like, the 30 different main student loan publications, and here's, like, and you have different verticals, right? Like, you have, like, they have communications that are read by colleges and consumers. And like, like you should be curating this list and <laughs> I, I, it's like your job. I don't know. Yeah. It's very yeah, frustrating I, because it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, I bet. I mean, it's, I mean, it seems frustrating, but it's also, it's kind of a good opportunity for you though. You know I what mean, I mean? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, we like to help people and, and show, show people what they should be doing. And I also think, you know, the hard part of the government is that they're not in the business of uh, financial advice. They're in the right. business of communicating, like, this is what options are out there. And that's where I do think that, like, we can help you is, like, how do you navigate it for your own situation? How do you, like, you know, kind of optimize it, right? Like, it's like tax, yeah. too, right? Like, in the tax code. Like, sure. you know, we all know that you should contribute to your IRA, but, like, should you do a Roth or a traditional or, mm -hmm. you know, how do you optimize it for your situation? And I think there's a lot of benefit in that for people. Yeah. I So... What do you think is going to happen though? So like going back to what we talked about like earlier, mm -hmm. it's like they start, a lot of people aren't going to be affected. Do you see any like ripple effects? Like what do you think is going to happen when, like, do you see any, any ripple effects across any industry after people start repaying? Not really. I, I, I really don't. I think a lot of it's so overhyped because our, you know, the media yeah. likes to overhype things. 
like, like it's like not much is going to happen. Um, there's especially things like the 12 month on ramp period. Like they're really like making this as like painless as possible. It's like, you're not going to see people like even getting wage garnishes or anything for at least 12 months. Yeah. Like I, I don't really see it being this detrimental thing. And I'll say the people that you see that are rattling it the most, like I can't afford things. They were having problems before their student loans started. Like, sure. let's be honest. It's like, this, this isn't going to change your financial situation one way or another. Yeah. And I, I always like to rephrase too, like, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, 80% of all student loan borrowers paid their loans just fine. Like right. they, all the stats, like, let's just say on the data, maybe they don't want to, like, let's be honest. I don't have to pay or I have to pay. I, I choose don't <laughs> have to pay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hundred percent. That's that's fair. <laughs> and so, like, when you're doing these surveys and different things, and it says like borrowers just like can't. Well, it's like, you know, they can't. Um, I read a really good quote um, from another student loan expert, and it was on Reddit. But she is basically like, my dad told me a story where it's like, you know, we all hated our teacher, and we all said we're just not going to turn in our assignments, and we're going to protest. And then the first kid goes up and is going to protest, and then none of the class followed. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and I do think that's like what happens. I think you definitely do have some vocal people that are going to protest, but I think you're going to have a wave of 80% plus that aren't going to fall. They're just going to yeah. go back to doing their things. They're going to pay their bills. Um, mm. You know, it's, it's there now. I, I don't want to dismiss, like there are people that need help. The system is a problem. There's a lot of issues. Sure. Like, of course, like, but it's not like this big tragic thing that's gonna like derail the whole u.s economy yeah i was talking to the team about it um maybe yesterday the day before but we were talking about just consumer spending and like i was just like i i based on the last like five six years like i think people are just gonna keep busting out the credit card like i just think that they're i think that that's how we are like i think we're just wired to do that as a country do you think well, the same I, thing it's not just that but like people haven't lost their incomes yet like, I think that's yeah. the bigger thing is that we have like still record low unemployment and job shortages. And so there's no, you know, all of the spending and everything is tied directly to your earnings. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's this, you know, you might not earn enough or you might not want that, but like, let's like be real here that like, there's a lot of jobs out there still that need to sure. be filled for our economy. The, I think the harder part though, is that people aren't in the right place. If, if that makes sense. What do you mean? Like, like you're seeing this mass layoff of like Twitter and like tech companies, but then like you have all these blue collar workers that are like, I need people. Yeah. And I think yeah. the hard part is it's the product of our economy for the last decade, two decades is where everyone needs to go to college and work in tech. And we didn't train up enough people to like go out and do these service jobs that are needed. And you can make, you know, $120,000 a year going and be a plumber, or electrician or any of these things. Right. Yeah. But I do think people are going to have to get pretty backed into a corner before they make that change. Like you get laid off from a tech company, you're probably only applying to tech companies. Yeah. And then at yeah. some point in time, you know, your budget and stuff is really going to start taking that hit and you're going to get a little more desperate and then you might look elsewhere. But this is where it's like, I do think things take a little time to unwind and get people in the right spot because you look at industries, healthcare is another one, right? Like we need nurses, teachers, education, uh, public safety. Like there's all these industries that quote unquote, don't require a college degree or maybe like associate's degree or some, some certification, but not like four year college that are hurting. But yeah. then you have like this oversupply here, but like, it's going to take people to get like a mental reality check, um, before they change that identity of themselves. Right. If they Wait, ever do. Do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> like it's, what does that look like? I think it's, it's tough. I, I think it's, it, people are going to have to really get back into a corner financially and, yeah. and then decide that they're going to go do something else. And I don't think all of them will, but I do think there will be enough that do switch um, into different fields. It's kind of the same thing that happened with the Detroit auto industry. I mean, that took years to unwind, but you know, like there's a, still a huge demand for like manufacturing jobs, just not car manufacturing jobs like right. they might be in solar or other industries or different things and yeah there also might be a moving cost like like it sucks but like you might have to move to other areas to get these jobs and that's hard and it, it might be yeah. financially difficult too for people right oh for sure for yeah. sure do you think 
do you think that we're going to get the soft landing? There's no such thing. No. Right. Yeah. That's what I've been thinking the entire time, but I'm just, I'm curious how you, how you see all that I, because it's so weird. Like when you're in it, you know, like when you're in a, an economic cycle, it's like maybe hard to see what it, what it might be. But like, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? I think we're going to have another financial crisis um, that's going to perpetuate into other areas of the economy. Um, I think we'll see that before we see a, a consumer crisis. I think really? we're going to start seeing some like commercial bank defaults. Like we already saw three defaults and they kind of rode out the storm, but like, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like 10, 15 more defaults. Like you just see like the, all these office buildings, people can't restructure their mortgages, but like, you know, all these things take a long time to unfold. Yeah. Like we're talking like they're going to negotiate for months and then they're going to file bankruptcy and then go to court and then yada, yada. And like, it's not, it's like a slow moving freight train. So it's like, you know, I think we can see it coming, but I couldn't tell you when, where. Sure. And I think on the flip side, if it's space is okay, like if it's not all in like a month or two period, uh, maybe we can have not as much contagion, <laughs> but like, if, <laughs> But if, if, if you start seeing a few major banks all fail at once and then like it continues to like ripple, um, I think that's where the problem will lie. And I do think our government is kind of inept. Um, so, yeah, you've said that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the theme, right? Um, yeah. I, I'm, well, they, when I you think say the hard major part banks. Is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the government, when I say inept, is that they refuse to make the right choices. And when I say right choices, they, they're hard choices, but like they could hurt people like citizens, but sure. like they need to be done for the economy. But like, they're so fearful of, you know, hurting individuals that they will like take the economy because they're trying to buy votes. Like I'm a big believer right. that it's all about, you know, money and politics. And like, I can't alienate people cause like I need their vote, but it's like, you know, you might need to, because like you got to save the economy. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, God, that would be terrifying if, <laughs> if all the banks started to fail. Um, and that was such a weird time. I mean, I think the last time we hung out, that's when that was happening. Right. Wasn't that like right in the middle of, I don't remember. Which yeah. Bank. And was it? it was which only one? three. It was first Republic Silicon Valley. It was yeah. three banks and it was pretty limited in the short term and they all had positives. So like first Republic, like JP Morgan wanted, wanted to buy first Republic for like a decade. Like yeah. first Republic was their biggest competitor in private banking for high net worth people. Yeah. And so it's like all they were just kind of waiting for the opportunity so that I can like literally pick up like my biggest competitor. Like, but I think you're where the problem is going to lie is you're going to get a bunch of banks that have a bunch of really crappy debt. Like the only thing with first Republic too, I think a lot of people don't realize is that like their problem was that they had all their loans on their books. They operate like a very traditional bank, yeah. but they also had the lowest default rate of any lender in the industry. Yeah, the I problem see was is that all the rates were so low, and so the value of those loans like dropped so much that they couldn't afford it. But if you had enough capital to just hold those loans for ten years, like enjoy it, you have the lowest defaulting portfolio of any <laughs> lender. It's just that they didn't have enough capital in the short term. But like a, a J.P. Morgan's, like I also just bought a ton of great stuff. Yeah, and I'm, I have the ability to do it. But I think there's going to be a lot of banks that don't have a lot of great stuff and they <laughs> really bad loans and a bunch of things. And that's when you start seeing these problems when like when 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 banks don't get bought and like the government's having to step in and like they're not being able to sell these assets. That's when things get kind of ugly because yeah. like, you know, it's like, oh, no one wants that one. And then the next one comes up and the next one comes up. Right. And then yeah. you start seeing it hit like you get like a bunch of foreclosed buildings around town and, and different things. And yeah. yeah, that's so interesting. Are you seeing a lot of that around you? Not a ton. No, honestly. Um, yeah. you know, I think the hard part is if we don't go downtown though, I think downtown is a very, uh, um, rough yeah. place here in San Diego. Um, a lot of homeless, mm -hmm. um, a lot of, you know, it's not very conducive to families and businesses. And, um, I think yeah. that's the problem. Like, you know, like we ditched our WeWork. We used to have a downtown office in a WeWork. You've been there. I mean, um, that was so awesome. I wanted to talk to you about that today. Like, it was a great place, yeah. right? But like, it just didn't make sense to pay, you know, I think it was only paying like 900 bucks a month too for it. It was great. Right. Um, but it didn't make sense. Like, it, it wasn't nice to go down there. Um, now I have this set up here at home. Like, why why pay that when I would have never gone? So I was like, eh, I'm just not getting the use out of it, right? Yeah. I don't want to go here. <laughs> 
I remember it was so cool though. When I walked in there and I was like, I remember walking in cause I'd never been in a WeWork before I walked in and there was like a bar to the right and there were people playing like cornhole and like, it was like beautiful San Diego. I was like, this is freaking perfect, man. This yeah. is awesome. And then it turned out to not be, <laughs> not be perfect, you know? And what sucks is the model still works and we have a bunch of those places popping up, but now they're slowly building them outside of downtown because people don't want to go downtown. And so, oh, dude, that's crazy. That's crazy. You know, I think it's, and then like, like we just had a big thing, like target just pulled out of downtown. Um, they were going to build a place. They decided not to Ritz Carlton was going to build a new hotel. They're like, Nope, not going to do that. Like we're getting a lot of that. Cause they're just like, eh, not, I don't want to deal with this uh, yeah. stuff. I wouldn't either. I mean, and I think the thing that's, that's wild about it is like, how do you roll it back? You know what I mean? Like, how do you, I mean, you got to do something at some point. Well, I don't think they could just let these cities just die. I think it's, it's a very catch 22. Like, I don't know why California like stopped, um, enforcing the law is kind of how I look at it. Right. Um, you know, I'm not against homelessness. I think there's a lot of root causes for homelessness and we need to help them, but I am against like public defecation, doing sure. drugs in public. <laughs> like, uh, we, I, I've talked to a lot of people about this. Like we've always had homeless people, but like when they were just sleeping there or in a park and they weren't like peeing right in front of you and different things, like no one really cared. It's like now that like, who said you could put suddenly put up a tent and block the whole sidewalk. And like, how come no one's like doing anything about this? Or who sure. said like, you can like literally take a crap right there in front of everybody and then not clean it up. And then like, this is okay. Like yeah. to me, it's like, let's enforce those laws. Like I'm not, homelessness to me is like, I don't know if it should be illegal. Probably not. Like you do you, like if you want to go into a forest and just lay around sure. or you want to like whatever, but you don't get to do drugs in public. You don't get to right. defecate in public. You don't get to like block the sidewalks. You don't get to assault people. You don't get to steal. Like, let's just enforce our laws that are on the books. <laughs> <laughs> not like, Yeah. I remember that was a big deal in Austin. Um, it, I mean, because uh, very truthfully, like in Texas, I think it's because of the climate. I'm not totally mm -hmm. sure, but if I'm guessing yeah. if I was uh, if I was a homeless person, I don't think I would want to be in like Houston in the middle of the summer when it's like a hundred degrees and a hundred percent humidity. Um, but Austin had a problem with that. And there was a big deal about, um, about camping, like just letting people camp. And I believe that they got rid of that. And I think it's cleaned, cleaned up quite a bit, but the drug thing is, is wild to me. Like the, uh, we, we just went to Oregon. I mean, do you know about Oregon's kind of drug? stuff that they've done where they kind of decriminalized. No, time. No. I, I don't know everything about it, but they've decriminalized it quite a bit. And, uh, and my uncle, uncle-in-law is a police officer or he's, I think he's retired now, but he was in Eugene and he was just like, it's crazy. <laughs> like, it's just, it's wild, you know, until the, you know, the, the problem is such a big problem. And I just don't know how you roll that back. Like, how do you get businesses to come back to places like that where, you know what I mean? And I'm not even necessarily against the decriminalization thing, but it's no different. To me, it shouldn't be any different than alcohol. Like, you don't get yeah. to be drunk in public. So, why do you get to be like high and passed out in public? Like, I, I sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, I don't know, understand. Like, public intoxication has been a thing for 100 years. Yeah. Like, why does it apply any differently if you're doing drugs or other things? Like, I do think we kind of went to like this extreme of lock everyone up for having some pot. Like, that's kind of dumb yeah. too, because I think it costs our society more and different things. Oh, for but sure. But like, you don't get to like be to a abuse public it. nuisance, and you don't get to impact negatively other people. Like, if you want to like do drugs at your house or at a party and yourself and your inside, like whatever. Sure. Not my style, but like, I'm not going to judge you for it. But like, you don't get to negatively impact your surroundings and other people, and I think that's the biggest problem. And I think the easiest way to roll it back is like start enforcing it these things like i always yeah. believe in accountability and you you what you allow you teach right and so it's like if you allow this stuff you teach this stuff and if you actually hold people accountable to it it goes away it's the same thing with all this crime and shoplifting and different things it's like everyone allows it and so like people just don't give a crap anymore but when you <laughs> stop allowing it you can resolve that thing pretty quickly um, right i think but it also comes with like public safety like we need to improve our law enforcement. I also think like we need to really ask ourselves, I'm not like a, a defund the police guy, but I am about like, do we need to have like different task force for different things? Like I, I kind of think like 
maybe instead of 100 police officers, we have 80 police officers, but then we have like 10 that deal with homeless that are a special team and a 10 that deal with like other like mental health crisis issues. Sure. Because I also know a lot of police officers and they don't want to go deal with like a homeless guy shitting on himself. Like, I would, yeah, I mean, I would <laughs> They want to go deal with like real crime. They want to go catch like, you know, felons. So it's like, I think you might, it like demoralizes them as much as um, it makes them not want to leave. So it's like, I think you need to like, Take that same budget. If we're going to have like a $100 million police department, maybe you don't have it all go to officers, but you also have these other crisis intervention people. And I think that got lost in like that defund the police argument. Like I'm not a big, like I want to still fund all of it, but like I think you need to have the right person do the right job. Yeah. (laughs) And I don't think uh, a police officer is necessarily the best person to respond to someone having a mental health crisis. I don't think that they're the right person to respond to a homeless person that's acting out. Like, yeah. Let's get the right people to respond to the right crisis. Like you don't have a firefighter respond to like a shoplifting, right? We kind of already do that with <laughs> other ways. Like let's do it like within, you know, be a little savvier with our money. I yeah. Yeah. Have you ever thought about going into politics? Fuck no. Really? You seem like you'd be good at it. I don't know. I just, I think, uh, I just, I could see you. I could see you doing it if you wanted to. I, 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 it's like, it's very catch 22. I think, I think the problem is, is American politics corrupts. And I, I'm a big believer that politics should have term limits. Yeah. Um, it should also have age limits. I agree and I think yeah. we should also eliminate all nepotism in politics. Um, and what I mean by that too is like I, state, federal, local, like if you're like 24 years removed or something outrageous, right? Like if your dad was on the school board, like, sorry, like you can't even like, you know, run for anything like you're out because (laughs) like, I think we need to break these like weird political dynasties in this country that, um, it's very strange. We know like Gavin Newsom is actually married to like Trump's daughter or whatever, or ex, you know, like they're all, Oh yeah. 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 Like, I don't know, but it's like, they're all fucking connected. (laughs) Republican Democrat. They're (laughs) all in this and they're all dirty. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Oh (laughs) man. Yeah. That's probably true. It is wild that we allow that. And, and even things like the, uh, the stock, the Clintons, the Bushes, like all of them, like the, the Kennedys, the, I don't want to see another Trump either. Like I, all of them, like you all get, you, your dad made it wonderful. He did like for 24 years, like no one in that lineage should be able to touch any kind of politics in this country. <laughs> Same thing with like all the sides, right? Yeah. I think that would be better. It, I think it's a, I think you can, can become wildly rich doing it though. Like, I think that's kind of part of the problem. It you is. Know? And I think, I think that's a huge problem. And, um, you know, I think that the way to solve that, like I said, is term limits. And yeah, I mean, I sure. do like to see more money get out of politics, but I don't know if that's going to happen, but like. I think we can really cut people down. I also think like you got to get these old people out. Um, it's getting like, rough. It's getting rough out there, dude. It's like weekend at Bernie's. Like, oh it's my God. Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just so it's so crazy. You see some of the stuff that people are doing, and it's like that, that these politicians like they stay in power so long, yeah. and all of their like you said, all their families involved, and then they've got mm-hmm. all these like shady ties to all this different stuff, and they're unbelievably wealthy. Like Mm -hmm. just a crazy, and it's like, nobody cares. And it's such a weird thing. It's like, everybody knows it, but nobody really cares. Right. And it's hard because the only way you're going to change the laws, if you get a lot of like newbies in there and like they change the law, like these guys are all so ingrained, they're not going to change the laws. But to me, that's the solution. And I think, you know, I think it applies at every level. I even see it here in local politics, but they have like this funnel, like Mm -hmm. they funnel up from like local to state to like these federal ones. And like, you can see the parties do it. And like, they're, they're just as shady in our California local elections. And it's like, you just see like the marionettes, like moving wheels. I don't know. Oh man. Yeah. That's, that's not good. Um, speaking of other things that are not good, (laughs) how do you feel about, Twitter and I don't know. How do you feel about the state of uh, like social media influencers, personal finance people? Because I remember, I think it was FinCon last time. Yeah. There was a, there was a guy that you were kind of battling with a little bit. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or not, but like, what do you think the state of that, of just personal finance, social media is right now? I think it's uh, I don't know how helpful it is. Like, Truly. And I think the hard part is, is like, we try to create our brand as being like New York times esque of helpful and like very reportive, but like, like I see like the barstool media and it's just like the salacious headlines and I'm like, shit, like they're just crushing it and they add no value, but like it's entertaining. (laughs) 
it's very entertaining. Like, yeah. and so like, like I try to figure out how to walk a fine line of entertainment and education. Um, my yeah. default though is education. And I think as a result, um, we struggle, I think a lot in terms of getting views and getting readers and stuff. Cause it's like, I'm not like this entertaining storyteller. Yeah. Um, but like, you, I don't know, it's very it's hard. So, so th tough, man. that's the, to me, that's the state of, uh, the media today is, and I think it's across, I, you could say social media, but I say all media, I say from the, yeah. uh, the major media, like Fox news and CNN, like they focus way so much on entertainment. Like yeah. it, they all try to be entertaining. And, um, as a result, the actual good stuff, the news, the real education, I think is getting very lost. Um, and then I think like we've somehow rewired like Americans brains that like to not think, um, <laughs> and they don't want to hear it. If you like, you know, throw out something that might contrast with like a belief system or a value set, um, you know, yeah. and I don't blame them. Like you came on a social media app because you want to get something that like makes you feel good. And yes. if it's not necessarily aligned to what you're feeling good about, like you might not want to hear it, read it, interact with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that it was so surprising the way that the TikTok. It, I mean, it was during the pandemic, but like some of the information that was coming out on TikTok, of just personal finance stuff you saw, like, I remember seeing one, there was a guy in a mask and he was talking about like the way to beat the stock market is to like wake up on the East coast or something and start trading early or something. It was some like dumb thing, but it was like, people believe this stuff and it's, it's, uh, I feel like it's just shifted so much. I mean, I started do, doing this back in 2015, it was mm -hmm. really not even that long ago. And it's changed so much from just like blogging to the social, you know, now it's, it's social media and like YouTube and stuff like that. And I just, I just wonder, it's like, is it just going to keep getting worse? I think it's, it's hard. I think it is going to keep getting worse because people like, it's just, you, you just keep feeding the machine what the machine wants. And it's just like continuing to, to drive it. But again, I do think at some point in time, people are going to hit that brick wall. Um, and I feel bad, like financially, it's either the economy is going to hit the brick wall or the, you know, whatnot. And I, cause I also think a lot of these influencers, and I think, you know, this, they haven't really built real businesses. Right. Um, even a lot of like, people don't realize that even advertising based businesses like ours, like, I mean, it ebbs and flows, but it, it's a challenging business model. Right. And, sure. um, it's when it's feast, it's wonderful. And you're getting paid to like put a bottle next to you and like promote <laughs> yeah. whatever. But as soon as the economy hits that wall, like all that money's gone. Marketing budgets, you know, are the first thing that, that go yeah. from a lot of these big corporations and a lot of them just don't make it. Right. And so, you know, how many of these influencers are still going to be around? Like we've been doing this for, you know, 13 years now this year. Wow. Um, and it's, it's still a struggle freaking every month, right? Like to, Girl, yeah. to get there. <laughs> it is much more, yeah, it is, it's much crazier. And I think, I think a lot of people don't realize that about the, the influencers. I think that, uh, a lot of, a lot of influencers don't have real infrastructure behind anything they're doing. Like, it's very like it, like you said, feast or famine. It's like, they're getting this deal. They're getting this thing. Like they're, it's like they've got to just, I mean, like any business, I guess you got to sell, but it's not like as automatic as you would think. Well, and I think the influencers, um, more power to them, but it's, I don't, I think also people realize how much work it is to try to create content daily or multiple times daily. And when you are the yeah. face of that, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Talk about burnout and stuff. And that's why you see a lot of these influencers, like just, they just burn out, they can't do it. And then it becomes, you know, feast or famine and then they have to, and then, you know, the content quality drops because it's like, it's hard. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. And it's one of the reasons like, I didn't want to be a personal brand. Um, I wanted to be more of a media centered brand because um, continually putting your own self out there every single day, all day is, is hard. Like, like, God, yeah, I can't do it. That's, and it's so funny. Cause like, you know, I, I own millennial money, man. Obviously that's a pretty personal brand, but we're, I mean, stellar media group is like the, what is, you know, what owns millennial money, man. And that's expanding in different ways, but it's like, I just, you know, I can write a lot. Um, but as you start to grow the guts of the business and you start to actually like try to build some infrastructure and hire people, like it is a, it is a grind to, to keep being the face of it. That's actually, I do. I know a lot of people hate on Dave Ramsey. And there's a lot of stuff I'm sure that like we both probably disagree with him on a lot of things. It's pretty 
massively impressive what he's built. I think I agree. And the fact that he still gets on the radio or whatnot, a podcast every single day or every other day, he's definitely doing a lot less these days. Have you noticed? Right. Like, but like for like 30, 40 years, I mean, cause he was doing this when it was radio, you know, and then whatnot, like, yeah. And then he actually built a scalable business around it. Um, is massively impressive. You might disagree with the stuff that comes out of his mouth, but like the business idea of that is very, um, very impressive. Yeah. And I think he's, I think he's built a lot of, uh, personal finance influencers careers, like inadvertently, <laughs> like, cause it's easy to hate on him. Like it's easy to hate on him and mm-hmm. use that as like the, you know, juxtaposition. But it's so, you know? you know, what's so interesting to me is, um, I am in looking at the Dave Ramsey and Ramsey solutions through the lens of the succession plan. And yeah, they are yeah. hitting some stumbling blocks on the succession plan. So, like, you know, it really is clear that he wants his daughter, Rachel Cruz, to to run it. But I don't know if she resonates as much uh, with it. And then, you know, he's been through, like, three or four other personalities that, like, you know, they just didn't connect with the audience. And now he's on, uh, I think his name's George Kamal or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, think I right. really like his style and he seems like he's identifying with Gen Z and millennial. So I'm excited to see if that's the guy that's going forward with it. But like watching this succession plan externally, because I mean, Dave's getting old, like, yeah, like life, you know, he can't do this forever. And like, who's going to inherit the Ramsey network is going to be interesting to see. Um, but I think like right now, George and Rachel Cruz are kind of like the the ones doing it, but like Rachel never really resonated. And now George seems like he is, but you know, I don't know. We'll see. You know who I liked a lot? Hogan. Yeah. Chris Hogan, right? I liked him a lot. I don't know Maybe. all the details of what happened with that. I know there I know were personal issues. There, there were some personal was... issues. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I don't want to go all, I'm, I don't, I don't know enough about it to go all the way into sure. it, but I thought he was the best out of all of the kind of like potential heirs to the throne. I just, I like that guy a lot. I saw him at FinCon. I don't know where that was. Maybe four years ago or something, right? He did like mm-hmm. a Chase Bank thing or something. Sure, yeah. Or Schwab. Um, who do you think is going to be the like? Who's up and coming in that area? Like, you've got Dave. You've got the Susie Orman. You got Ramit. Like, do you think anybody's coming up after that? Like in terms of building like a massive. Yeah, yeah. Like just the empire. mega. Yeah, the mega empire. Like the kind of personal, like the guru based empire. Yeah, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, they all have their niches, right? So, like, I mean, Ramit's got his diehard following. He had his Netflix show, too, which was yeah. interesting. Did you um, like so, Yeah, you know, like, um, I did. I, I think it was really good because uh, I feel – I miss money shows on TV, man. I used to love the Susie Orman. <laughs> so it's like the fact that these are out here, I think his advice is fair. Um, I can disagree on some points. I think he, like, botched the student loan stuff. Um, mm. But then I also don't know how much is edited for TV. Right. right you know, right. so it's like I, I can't – dude, huge props to Ramit. That phenomenal – I hope they yeah. come back for a second season. My wife and I loved watching it. Um, and I like since I know him enough, like I'm not like anything, but I've followed him for a decade. He's we've gone in the same spheres. Like he knows what's up. I don't know if the what was edited on the show was exactly the best, but yeah. you know what I mean. Like it's cool to see him out there and getting this message across to people because I think he has a lot of value to add. I think so too. He's good at it. the thing that I am not good at for sure he's good at like battling people. Like he'll, he'll go on Twitter and it's like whatever that style of marketing is where you can go and just like battle with people in the comments and like yeah, yeah. retweet people and stuff. Like I can't do that. I have a hard time doing that because this feels very like toxic to me, but I, there are so many people that are so talented at doing it and I don't think that they do it maliciously at all. I think it's just, they realize like this is a really good marketing strategy. Yeah. 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 So but it's yeah, just I, wild. I don't necessarily see a lot of gurus though. That's the interesting thing. But you know what I do see today is a lot of communities. Um, mm. And they're more around Reddit and stuff like that. But I feel like people, instead of identifying to a person like a Dave Ramsey or a Ramit, I see people identifying to a style like Fat Fire, Fire, um, yeah. you know, Bogglehead Investing, um, things mm. like that, that are, I guess, you know, like, they're communities that are oriented around a mindset, even like, I guess like Mr. Money Mustache is still in the fire, but he's not as much of a personality anymore. But I think that fire community is still very strong. Um, things like that, man, when I first got in into the personal finance game, it was like, that was when fire was, and that's for people don't know financial independence, retire early. That's when it was like huge. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still that big anymore. Maybe it is. Maybe it's even bigger now, but it doesn't seem, it's not getting like the headlines that it used to get. You know? I agree with you, but I think that, that die hardcore community is still there. Um, a hundred percent. Uh, but like, it's interesting that we haven't seen a lot of personalities emerge. Like I thought choose Fi had like a, a chance. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's sure. kind of, they've kind of, not to say that they've fallen off, but I just don't see them out there that much anymore. I think even like the band broke up and like they're doing different things now, but like they still have the community going. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like if you go on Reddit, like there's some really solid communities and I see it on Facebook, too. Um, I see like, thing, you know, like I think those communities exist and I actually think it's almost like a better a better way to do it because I feel like you kind of learn and grow. Like I feel like Dave Ramsey is a good entry point if you struggle with personal finance. Yeah. But like oh, you sure. start, you start nailing the basics and you're like, okay, what's next? And I don't <laughs> know if Dave Ramsey is the best of what's next, but then you start finding things like the fire community or, you know, other communities. Um, that could be a great what's next. And then you kind of keep, you know, going on and on. Right. Yeah. Are you a fire guy? I don't know if I've ever asked you that before. Um, I love the financial independence aspect. Uh, you know, I'm a retire optional guy. Um, I think that Fire, all the, yeah, like the idea of financial independence is, is, is what everyone should aspire for because it's gonna, you have to get there one way or another. Like you're done working at some point in time. I mean, you just are like yeah. whether voluntarily cause you retire or hopefully not, but you know, it happens involuntarily because you get a disease, a disability, you get too old to do your job, whatever. Right. For sure. So your whole goal is to get to this financial independence spot. Um, the question is, is do you want to retire early or in, you know, not, cause I think a lot of retire early is escapism, um, Ooh. which is fine. Like people are trying to escape the workplace. They hate their jobs. They don't want it. Um, but like for me, like I love my job. Like I, I guess I'm technically financially independent, mm-hmm. but like, I, my wife's like, you should just stop working. We should just live the fire lifestyle. I'd be bored all day. Yeah. <laughs> like I need to like do something <laughs> with my time. And she's like, you can hang out with me. And it's like, I love hanging out with you, honey. <laughs> but like I need, I need a little break here and there. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I think uh, it's so interesting. Uh, we actually have a web developer on our team. That's like very, very into fire. Yeah. Um, and he's got, he's going to do it. I mean, nice. He's going to do it early. And it's like, it's just such an interesting thing though, because it's like, you can see how they scrutinize like every single purchase and like every little thing is about, and it just, to me, it seems very exhausting, but I think if you're trying to escape something like you said, like, I think it's worth it. I just don't think I would be happy. Like, I think I would be pretty miserable, but I think there's two sides to this. So like, it's like the levels of fire, right? So there's the lean fire idea, which is, um, especially for those listening, this is where it's like you try to retire on the littlest amount you need. Yeah. And I think at that level, you really have to scrutinize everything. Then there's just like, you know, fire, which is like 20, you need to like save up 20 times your annual savings, like pretty average kind of gets you to what you're getting today. Right. And then yeah. there's fat fire, which is like, you know, you just have so much, you could probably live on 250 K a year or so or more because you have enough assets to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and so like, I think if you're really trying to do the escapism and lean fire, like that, that really die hard, like I'm going to shop at Aldi and budget to save $5 here and $5 there. Um, it can get you there, but I don't know how enjoyable it is, but I do think that we all have a lot of opportunities to save and like the amount we blow on dumb stuff, like can really add up over time. So even if you're trying to do fire or fat fire, like you know, if you can save a hundred to a thousand dollars on something like it's meaningful, uh, I think in a lot of ways, you know, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. It's actually interesting. You, um, you've actually been a pretty big influence on me with, uh, just not be, I used to be super frugal. Like I used to be like, I was like, like hurting myself frugal. Um, and even, even after I started making decent money, I would still, I was still living that way. And I don't really know why. Um, but, uh, like you've talked to me a lot about like, uh, you know, when you travel, like doing a little bit, like upgrading a little bit and like doing yeah. the car service and like upgrading. And I've been doing that and it's so much better. Like it's so wild how much better it is. And it's like, you travel's much less stressful. It's like, and why it's like that, you know, it is more, but like, is it, it's not, you're not flying private. It's like, it's incrementally like, you know, you could do an Uber, like you just said, car service is a great one. 
Yeah. I could pay an Uber and it's like 40, 50 bucks. I could RSVP for a black car service and it's like $90. So it's like $40 right. more, but like they're aware <laughs> with the little sign and you're just handled. Like yeah. that's a huge benefit for like just a fractional bit of more spending. And granted, I'm doing that like maybe once or twice a year. So yeah. it's not even like, you it's know. It's not a big deal, but you're treating yourself a little bit. You know? you're, you're definitely treating yourself. I don't want to dismiss that at all. Um, like in a good way though. Like it's, it's good. I think it's no, like but some people that might not thing. be there, but I'm also a big, like kind of remit guy in terms of his value levers. Yeah. Like some people might not value that convenience factor. Like it's not in their DNA. Like, and I see this a lot cause, uh, FinCon's coming up one of my favorite events and yours, yeah. but like, um, there's like 2000 financial influencers going to one place. And like the Facebook group for this event is like starting to pop off and people are asking all these <laughs> questions. And like, there are definitely the people like, how do I take the cheapest public transportation from the airport to the hotel <laughs> to like spend as little as possible. And you got the people who are like, I'm going to get an Uber. Do you want to share an Uber? And then like, you know, like there's people like me that might get a private car just to like have it all coordinated. Right. Um, you know, there's yeah. just so many various levels of, you know, different ways to spend it. And it's really interesting to see all the perspectives because it's just the value levers, right? Like, yeah, you know, people, value I like your things. way though. Your way, ever since I've been trying your way, it's way better. Like, it's nice. It's a good way to go. And I still owe you, I owe you a, a, a very fancy bottle of bourbon. I don't know if I, I think I told you I was going to do that and I haven't done it. So I'm going to talk to my sister about that after and we're going to send you something. But just even like that, like you just, you gave me a nice bottle of wine and you're just like, it was kind of an abundance mindset thing. And I was like, damn, that's a good, that's a good way to think about things. Well, and I think you do that with your, like, uh, your courses, right? Yeah. 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 We send, uh, when people do well, we, we send like very nice bottles of champagne and stuff like that. I, I like the physical gift thing too, because I do feel like it's lost, um, in today's digital age. Uh, you know, to me, I think it's really cool. Like we can give Amazon cards and you can do that, but like to get something that's like physical, that that's not like a waste too. like you'd enjoy, I think is, is nice. Like, you know, you could do like a, a basket of like nuts or something. <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah, know if people want deal. that. <laughs> it's a big deal. People like it. And like even team members, like on our team, like we'll send stuff. Mm -hmm. Like everybody likes that kind of stuff. Um, I had two more things I wanted to ask you about today. They're kind of, they're sort of related. You've mentioned Reddit a couple of times. Yeah. I was actually, it's funny, but we were on our retreat last week and, and we were talking about just different strategies and I was, I was telling them about you and I was like, I don't know if you still do this or not, but like there was a time where you were like in Reddit, like maybe you still, do you still do that? I'm, I read it's my primary social media platform That's so uh, <laughs> to, en to, to enjoy social media. Like I love to read it. I have it super curated, like all the subreddits I want to follow, which is like a big mix of everything. Um, yeah. and then yes, uh, I, um, I answer questions. I probably been answering 20 to 30, um, like posts a day, especially in the student loan section, 20, 30 uh, days. Oh because God. there's so many, um, questions right now too. Like there's like a post every like three, four minutes. Now the student loan payments are restarting. And like, uh, oh, I know yeah. the mod team there and there's only like three of them. Like, uh, they're great people too, but like, I'm just in there trying to help and respond and Dang. answer questions. And then, you know what, like from a business perspective, yeah, like there are linking opportunities, but I've also built enough credibility in that subreddit that like they know who I am. I have a tag that says who I am. So I'm not like trying to hide it that like I'm not trying to. But yeah, I am self-promoting because I have the best answer to this question. Right, and, right. You know, but I get, I'm allowed to do that effectively because I build a reputation there. Of being yeah, able to. for sure. What So for somebody that because I'm not huge on Reddit, I mean, I'll go into it. I, I think it's it's interesting because I think the search results that you get from Reddit are, are pretty good. Um but like, what, what are the ones for people that are listening that have like no idea about the whole Reddit personal finance thing? What would you recommend? Um, so the one thing with Reddit is it's kind of, well, first off it's subreddit oriented. So there's a subreddit for everything. Um, and you can start going down a rabbit hole. So yes, there's a personal finance subreddit. There's also a bunch of fire subreddits. There's lean fire, there's fat fire, there's student loans. There's even like niche ones within student loans, like student loan defaulters for those that don't want to pay their loans. Mm -hmm. There's public service loan <laughs> forgiveness awesome. that people that want to get their student loans forgiven, but like there's niche ones too. Uh, there's a new one that's really popped off. I'm surprised you're not in it is the, the side hustle subreddit is, uh, should it's be. really <laughs> popping off. Uh, there's a side hustle subreddit. Um, and so, but the cool thing is, is that Reddit, you have all these subreddits that you can just read each subreddit individually, but then on your home feed, it'll curate the thing. And the one thing I do love about Reddit is, um, there's upvoting and there's downvoting yeah. and you get this giant community that will either upvote or downvote. And so your home feed 
is not algorithm based like the Facebooks of the world. It is literally like the world has voted and that's why you're now seeing it in your home feed. So like your content, if you actually like sign up for a bunch of subreddits and are curated well, um, you get a great home feed experience because like it's yeah. literally what like people that know what you like have voted this to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've got to get more involved in it. It's just tough because I don't want to, you know. But I, I know I probably should. Um, the, kind of related to that though, um, and this is not I'm, this is not actually a, like a Google related question. It kind of is, but kind of is not. Kind of is not AI. Like, where do you see that taking us from a personal finance perspective? Like, do you do you see some like cool things coming up with that? No, AI yeah, nothing. A, uh, no. I see nothing with AI. I think a lot of people were like, oh my God, AI is like the greatest thing ever. And I'm like, you guys, what we call AI today is a natural language model. Right. Yeah. It scrapes the internet or whatever data set it is given and it regurgitates it all together. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't always do it well. So I don't know if you've done a lot in the personal finance space, but like these AI answers are like terrible. They're, like, ter yeah, they're, they're, they're like wrong. <laughs> Like they're actually like, you could really hurt yourself financially listening to AI. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, they are bad. I was trying it the other day. I think I was actually on Quora, uh, Quora um, cause they've got the chat GPT feature in it and I did it and I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. <laughs> like this is really, really bad. And that's why I don't think people, so people really need to realize that like the AI that we call AI today is a, a language model. It's not actually like thinking or trying to figure it out. It's very good at like reading massive amounts of information and trying to regurgitate something based on your input. That's mm -hmm. what AI does today. Um, not to say that it's not going to get better or, you know, sentient in the future. And maybe then <laughs> it will like have good answers. But as of today, and I'd say probably for the next couple of years, like, um, I don't think AI really has a place. And I, I think we're even seeing it in the content creation world. Like, I think Google is like the AI content is not, I mean, it, people are having some success with it. Like, let's not, let's not damper sure. on it. Like there's definitely people that are having success with it. They're usually an anomaly and they're probably editing it heavily and trying to fix it. So they're still spending a vast amount of time. Like no one's actually like creating it. You know, yeah. the Google and the internet has had scraper sites and uh, generated content for as long as I've been blogging. Like it used to be a thing where you could have a bot, like make like 50 iterations of the same article and then like you'd post it and like that could rank. Like that's, a, <laughs> that's an SEO strategy from like 10 years ago. And to me, this AI revolution is very similar because that's exactly what it's doing. It's like reading all this stuff on the internet and then like putting together something that may or may not be accurate. Yeah. Um, so I'm like, I'm not bearish on it. I'm not bullish on it though. I, I think it exists and I don't think it serves uh, a purpose that's very practical for anyone today. And I know I've talked, I've actually talked to a lot of companies on this cause they're like, we got to integrate AI. We got to integrate AI. I'm like, how, what, what are you going to do? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> and I was talking to one, it was like a budgeting app. And I was like, here's some good ideas, but I don't know if AI is the right way to call this, but like you can analyze people's transactions and you could say like, Hey, I noticed you haven't made an IRA contribution yet today. Mm -hmm. Like send reminders and alerts to them. And like a lot of apps already have that though. Like they're like, you spent $500 more on travel this month than you normally do. You know, like you yeah. get those. So it's like, is it, but is it that useful? And then I know there's a few apps that actually shut down lately because they're like, no one actually wanted to like ask their personal finance questions in natural language. It's like, you're right. No one wants to, I want to see like a chart. I want to see the data, like the idea that I could say, like, how much did I spend this much on Netflix? Like, why would I want to type that sentence when I could like see a line that says, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't know. That was not the answer I thought you were going to give, but no, I, I think, I think you're, you're probably right. And those, those answers are terrible. Um, and I think, but I also say like, go play with it. Right. So like right. where I do think, uh, I mean, AI is not going anywhere, at least in the short term. Sure. So go try it. 
mm, see if I'm full of shit or not. <laughs> but like, I also see it a lot. Like we just did an article yesterday um, that was fun. Is like, do colleges care about chat GPT and all these AI writing assistants for college admissions essays? Cause it's that time of year. That's what we're thinking about. Um, and like, we were trying to get some data, like do colleges care? And it's a mix. Some colleges are like, do not use this. We use AI detection software and we'll reject your application. Other ones are like, don't care. And then there's a lot of them in the middle that are like, you can use it, but make sure you write it and it's in your own words yeah, and all this yeah. stuff. And so as I think these, like, that's kind of the interesting one. Cause like, I think AI can really help you like outline, it can be a tool, right? Like it can be a tool just like search and Wikipedia can be a tool. Like you shouldn't copy and paste your search results or your Wikipedia entry. Um, yeah. <laughs> AI can be a tool too, right? Like you can use it, but like, it's, it's not the end all be all right. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. what do you think I, the answer was I was going to give? I dude, I don't know. I th you're, you're so up on things. I thought you were going to like have all these, Oh yeah. Like this, you know, AI is going to revolutionize X, Y, Z thing. But I think if you're it, probably if it was right. Real, like if it was like real AI that could like, sure think for itself or something that would be really cool but what we're calling ai today is not that not ai <laughs> yeah well i think there was a lot of hype too i think that you know when chat gpt like started working out of nowhere it seemed like out of nowhere um i think it was like everything's gonna change that's all you saw on twitter or x um you know chat gpt is gonna cancel you know every industry that's related to writing or you know whatever is gonna go under and like not really a whole lot's changed since then i mean like you see the google lab stuff where they're they're trying things out but but even like google is like continuing to iterate now and they realize that those they call it sge or whatever i think mm -hmm. and they realize that the answers were so crappy that <laughs> now they're basically making a new search result box for you so if you try their new sge or like their bard or whatever like they'll give you an answer and then they'll they'll basically link to all the articles where they pulled this answer from because like the actual answer was so crappy. So basically now you're getting, instead of like a search result today with like 10 results, their new one is called SGE and you're getting a search result with like three with like little boxes that you can like click through and read the whole article, right. which I think makes sense. But oh, what'd you know? Like content creation still has a purpose. And then I also think that like, where's all this data coming from, right? Like people have to yeah. create this content for them to even like source and, and do. And, um, you know, like if you were trying to do some AI and say like, hey, what's the save student loan repayment plan um, until July of this year, there would have been zero way that any computer could have done that for you because the content didn't exist. And then once the <laughs> Department of Education released Good it point. and then like we created content and then like now there's probably, you know, 100 articles on the Internet for it. It can answer, but it's only because like we created these content and it right. might have scanned it. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And I've thought about that. It's like if they if they need publishers to create the answers, they can't get rid of the publishers or they would have to just start paying like a staff, you know, like a staff or something to do that stuff for them so that they could spit out the, the answers. And then why would they even do that? It seems like that doesn't. <laughs> right. Make sense. And then it's like, is this really? But then again, is this really A.I.? Right. Like, yeah, yeah. This is not artificial <laughs> intelligence. No, you're just scraping websites and like putting the data together. That's what you're doing. That's a good point, man. I don't well, know. I appreciate your time, buddy. Um, tell everybody where you're, where to find you. Yeah, man. So you can guys can find us at the college investor on the show, podcast, the college investor. And if you like video, um, TikTok, YouTube, the college investor. So yeah. Awesome, However you man. like to your content. You're going to be at FinCon. Of course you're going to be at FinCon. I will be at FinCon. I, I, we're talking this year. Uh, we're going to talk about building your blogging team. Uh, okay, and so okay. we're doing it with a few people on how you build a, a nice editorial team or any, or your whole team really. And then, uh, I think I'm doing a first impressions, uh, thing on the main stage where I'm going to like tear main down some people's, yeah, some people's sites, I think, uh, Dang. but that should be fun. Cause I, I like doing that. Like I didn't really, I told, uh, I told the team, I don't want to give a speech, but if you have something else for me, they're like, do you just want to like give feedback to people? It's like, I love giving <laughs> feedback to people. <laughs> Let's do it. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we're bringing the, we're bringing the millennial money man team, almost love everybody it. out this year. Nice. Um, so did you find cool. a restaurant? Are we going someplace nice? Can I join the team? Oh, Hey dude, if you want, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. What do you know when your main stage or, well, do you know when either one of those things are? Nope. I don't. I think my talk is on Saturday. Uh, I do know that. Okay. But I don't know what my main stage thing is. And then we're going to do a team dinner as well on that Thursday night. So Okay, cool. Well, thanks for coming on, dude. I, I want I want to have you back. There's so many other things I want to talk to you about. You know, I feel like there's you can talk about a lot of different topics. 
Uh, I even talked to Larry last time about aliens, like are aliens a real thing? So I'd love to nice. dig into that with you. I don't know how you feel about Dude, that. Dude, I'm, I'm happy to. This is fun. I, I like this uh, I like this setup. This is great. Hopefully you'll see me. In, if we do it again, I'll be in my real office now. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, that'd be cool. I can't wait to see that. Well, thanks, man. Um, yeah. Appreciate it. And uh, talk to you soon. Sounds good.